It is now 7 a.m. and you're tuned to Love 101 FM, the family station. It's now time for the morning watch. Listeners to Love 101 FM are advised that the views and opinions expressed in this program are not necessarily those of Love 101 FM. Hello, 101 FM. I'm your host, Dylan Toussaint. A special welcome to us on love101.org. And if you're overseas and on the move, U.S. listeners can access us at 712-832-8001. And if you're in the U.K., 0330-332-6541. Or join us via the Love 101 FM app that can be downloaded from the Google Play Store or the Apple Store. You can also join us on Love 101 FM Facebook and YouTube Live. In the first watch today, gunning for the guns. What's right and what's wrong about this amnesty? In the second watch, employment post-COVID. For our social media question we ask, how effective or successful will the gun amnesty be? Please share your responses on our Love 101 FM Facebook page and YouTube channel, and also on WhatsApp 876-997-3125 using the hashtag The Morning Watch. We'll share your responses later on in the program, but before all of that, here's I quote. Hello, Winning isn't everything, but wanting to win is. Vince Lombardi. Good morning, Victor. Good morning, sir. How are you doing? I am well. Long time no see or hear <laughs> at this time of the morning. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Have you been feeling the Christmas breeze, my brother? Uh, not quite yet. Not quite yet, sir. <laughs> <laughs> now blow your way. <laughs> it hasn't quite reached my side yet. All right. We have to look into that. <laughs> yes, sir. The first watch will be back after this break. heart condition, your care should be in the hands of our experienced cardiovascular team at Partners Interventional Center of Jamaica. We're one of the leading heart centers for angiograms, stenting, pacemakers, EP studies, and ablation therapy. PICJ has the expertise and latest technology to treat all your heart needs. Call 876-995-7425 or email info at pic-jm.com for appointments. PICJ, your partners for life. Welcome back to the Morning Watch. I'm your host, Dylan Toussaint. Now, today is day five of the 14-day gun amnesty. Will it work? The amnesty is to allow persons in possession of illegal or unregistered firearms and ammunition to surrender these weapons to the state without the fear of prosecution. However, some quarters are suggesting that it is doomed to fail. But how and why? Well, to discuss these and other related issues we have online, Mr. Michael Diamond, President of the Consumers Intervention Jamaica, and Lieutenant Commander George Overton. President of the Jamaica Society for Industrial Security, JSIS. J 
Jesus. Good morning to you both. Good morning to you and to your listeners. Okay. Good, morning. Good morning. Okay. All right, gentlemen, what are your commendations or concerns, really, the imposition of this gun amnesty in Jamaica? Beginning with you, Commander Overton. All right. Um, I am one of those that I, I don't have much hope for success, and we measure success by the number of guns that will be turned in. But in the same breath, I believe that we should not go forward without giving the opportunity for those who are in possession of illegal guns to turn them in. And um, it's, I, I suppose it would be a box-checking exercise before mm. the full implementation of the new legislation. All right. So, so well, you don't seem to give it much, much marks. Um, come on. Now. No, and, and and the truth is that that those who are in possession of guns have it for their their intent. Illegal guns, they have it for their intent, and just turning it in is not going to 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 make any change. You know, if confrontation mm -hmm. with the police could lead to eventual death and they're still keeping them, then what is going to prison? Hmm. Mr. Diamond, your take on that? Well, yes. The, the views expressed so far are definitely the sentiments of a lot of individuals. The, the fact of the matter is that, you know, we all welcome and support any, any solution or any, anything that can bring us on a path to reduce our gun crime and violence in Jamaica. Yet we also have to be realistic. And for us, well, for me especially, I am more concerned about what exactly informed the position to do a gun amnesty when in other jurisdictions, other areas, it mostly fails. It, it doesn't work, you know. And in this landscape of things that we're dealing with right now, the fact that there is lack of public education and information on the situation, the, there doesn't seem to be full cooperation by all stakeholders that can bring about a difference. Because it's not just turning in the guns, but we also wanted a, a change in mindset, you know, and a, certainly a change in behavior going forward, not just mm. into the fact that there's a legislation that will give individuals more stiffer penalties for breaches. So the idea that we have is done amnesty and we're day five into it and It'll be interesting to see what I've collected so far, or even the interest from the community so far. But the fact of the matter is that while our expectations are not that high, we need to look at how we can garner this opportunity to bring more cooperation, especially you know from our from our stakeholders. Because in fact, this gun amnesty would achieve very little as far as serious criminals are concerned, and for those who have minor administrative issues regarding lack of gun life, etc. A gun amnesty wouldn't necessarily deal with that situation that can be, you know, dealt with on a daily basis, utilizing the discretion that the firearm license authority has. So, you know, it's, it's for a while it's very interesting, you know, and our expectations are not as high. Mm. There are still there are still challenges here that I that I in my purview has been ignored. Hmm. But by the way, gentlemen, um, do, do either of you have any idea how many guns have been um, handed in so far? Uh, no, the, the last I heard, um, which was a statement by the minister, I believe it was on Monday, which would have been day three of the amnesty, that That's none had been turned in thus far. Yeah, none. And, and then subsequent to that, I think... Um, was it FLA? I understand. Don't quote me on that. Perhaps some some have been turned in. But but on that note, though, um, Commander, um, you you said that you would measure success by the number of guns that will be turned in. Correct. What what's the number? What what figure are you looking at? <laughs> <laughs> as, 
that, that's a question. If my crystal ball could tell me how many illegal guns are out there, I think we would be well ahead in, in dealing with the problem. I don't think we have an idea of how many illegal guns are in the country, but the, the indicators are certainly that there are a significant number of illegal guns. No, 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 no. What I'm saying is, you said the measure of success by the number of guns that will be turned in, right? Verbatim. What number would satisfy you to say that this has been a success? That has I think if in? we were able to, to get maybe 30, 30 or 40 guns in through the amnesty, it would be an indicator that, yes, it was worth its while and that um, okay. people are listening and, and, and willing to participate in the process. Hmm. What about you, Mr. Diamond? you have any figure? Well, I, I, I would certainly hope that number would be a lot greater. Um, success <laughs> for me would definitely be, unless this amnesty brings in over 500 guns. <laughs> 500? It really wasn't an issue. And I, I say that because, remember, this month passed when there was really a get the guns by the by the KTF and they were digging up guns all over the place and they were coming up with hundreds of guns. You know, this is a situation that now here is a legal framework pathway for individuals to cooperate and successfully bring in their weapons without, you know, immediate prosecution. And then we only get thirty. You know, that is that is a, that is not even a drop in the bucket. So the reality of it is that the time period is too short. You know, an estimation is too short. We need a better public campaign regarding, you know, what it actually means, what it could do for our communities. And in my estimation, this gun amnesty should have actually been running all the way until the end of January, where we would have had a list of public, um, of media, you know, promotions regarding this and to incorporate the stakeholders, especially for the community leaders, the community churches, you know, that can have access to dissemination of information in a more readily available fashion. So, you know, the idea that we have this for 14 days, it's, it's just not realistic. So you are, you are, you are, you are advocating, uh, Mr. Diamond, for it to be longer, extended. I would we say, too short? Yes, the reason why we should extend this is because ultimately the gun amnesty, the aim of it, you know, is really to help to reduce the amount of guns out there, to reduce gun violence. And we're not going to achieve that in 14 days. When that's, 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 not, that's not likely. So the idea of it is that how many individuals in the public right now are sensitized or has information about the amnesty that they would be willing to cooperate, they would be willing to encourage others. Not many. You know, 14 days is not enough time for doing that. And mm -hmm. just as a side reference, these fellows, the first and Caicos, they had a gun amnesty for 30 days. And in that 30 day period, they collected zero guns. You know, so yeah, yeah. a lot. In the Turks and Caicos. So we have a situation here that we have examples from other jurisdictions. We should have put the best practices. We should have seen how they fail and what we need to implement for a public education campaign sustainable over several weeks and months is what will bring about a difference, at least. What couldn't it be but argued that the, Tur the Turks and Caicos um, example you give there? Um, perhaps it could be argued that is why it should not ex extend it. It doesn't matter. Uh, in in terms of if, if they had 30 days and they couldn't bring in one weapon, then we have to look at how well was the media campaign, how well was the in public information and engagement with the public and the communities in general that may have been a reason why it failed. But simply saying 14 days, gun amnesty, if you're caught with a gun, you could have very severe penalties. That is not enough. Guns today already have penalties. Individuals are not willing to turn in their guns. So how do we change that mindset and behavior? It takes time. There's a psychological barrier regarding it. So if we do not incorporate that in our policies going forward, then we would just it's be a futile effort, you know, just simply saying it and hoping that people respond when we know that there are psychological barriers that we should have overcame before implementing such an end. Interesting. We have one minute to break. Um, Commander Overton, your take on that. Should the time be extended? No, I don't think so. And, um, you know, I, I believe that, as, as was said earlier, that when we had the Get to Guns campaign, we saw them coming in. I believe that the intelligence is there. I believe that the methodology is there. And therefore, who don't take advantage of the gun amnesty will feel the consequences as the enforcement comes about. 
<laughs> oh boy. So, so on one hand, we're talking about the um, proposal for it to be extended. Next one doesn't see much of a difference there. Um, the, before the break, um, um, well, we're up on break now. We'll be right back, gentlemen. <clears throat> Get better coverage for yourself and your family as low as $800 a month. The time by JN Life Vest from JN Life Insurance is... It is now 7.15 a.m. For all your carpet needs, come to the Carpet Store Limited. We do carpet cleaning, installation, custom rugs, and much more. We are the largest distributors of carpets in Jamaica. We also stock a wide variety of area rugs in different styles and sizes, such as wool, jute, and sisal, among others. Follow us on Instagram at the carpet underscore store, or visit us at 18 Dumbarton Avenue, Kingston 10. You can call us at 876-649-0174. The Carpet Store Limited, because you deserve the best. Planning to sit the May-June CXC exams privately? Register with Overseas Examinations Commission before the registration deadline, Friday, November 25. Visit our Kingston office or Montego Bay office to complete your application form or send an email to help at overseasexams.org.jm. Follow our social media pages at Overseas Exams for more details. Remember, if you plan to sit the May-June CXC exams privately, the registration deadline is November 25. Welcome back to the Morning Watch. Thanks for staying with us. I'm your host, Dylan Toussaint. And in this, the first watch, we are discussing the whole matter of the gun am amnesty, which um, is now five days on. And in so doing, we have online Lieutenant Commander George Overton, President of the Jamaica Society for Industrial Security, and Mr. Michael Diamond, President of Consumers Intervention Jamaica. Um, Commander Overton, uh, what about the whole matter of the, the publicity, um, the pay, you know, in, in terms of the, the, the nation being made aware of it, advertisements, whatever, and the, the whole matter of incentives, should incentives have been thrown into the mix? Commander. Um, I, I believe that, I believe that, um, the advertising campaign could have been better. We have not heard as much as I believe it should have had um, since the, the beginning of the amnesty. Um, the, the, the campaign with funding, I believe, yes, you may have had more guns turned in um, if there were financial incentives, but I do believe that there's a parallel program that is being run by the government um, that, that pays for information or for the recovery of an illegal gun. I believe that is still in progress. So, you know, it, it's almost like you have competing activities. Um, mm. But I do agree that we could have had a better advertising campaign. Your take, Mr. Diamond? Absolutely, absolutely. You know, once we take any program that we're doing seriously and it has national, you know, um, implications, then we cannot ignore that without public education, without the sensitization of the public and how they play a role, then, you know, it, it, it's almost as if we're attempting to take steps backwards and hope for better. Mm. Where we are today, the fact that they already offer the amnesty, you know, we have to support it. Now, if this decision came and asked whether we should have a gun amnesty, then the answer would be no without conditions. Because if you're not going to put in what is necessary for an amnesty, they are not enforcing their amnesty amongst the population that are predominantly ignorant of what is happening, then clearly it, it, it's built to fail from the very beginning. You know, um, just brushing it off, saying that, well, we don't need to give incentives because the incentive should be that you don't get 15 years in prison. Those kind of remarks from the security minister, it, 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 it's, it's disingenuous, especially for what we're hoping to accomplish. So, you know, there are things that we need to really be serious about and gun control is something we must be serious about. You know, my suggestion, if I could suggest anything to the security minister, is that whenever there's going to be a special operation declared, 
within that time period that it's going to run, or for an amnesty within that zone that individuals can turn in the gun for the security forces. So, you know, we need to look at creative ways in which we can get community mm. involvement to achieve mm. you know, success. Uh, uh, now, Shiva, I heard you clearly, uh, Mr. Diamond. Are you for the incentives? You think they should have been included incentives this time around? But I'll tell you that I've done my I've done my research and I've spoken to individuals that may have fit the criteria for who the amnesty aimed at. And one of the things that they mentioned is that the cost of weapons and the incentives that they would give it does not correlate. You know, so no one is gonna no one is gonna give a weapon in when he paid a million dollars for that weapon and collects only half. You know, so there, there's also that value incentive that they're looking at. So the idea of the buyback program that some would consider, I don't agree with the buyback program. What what I would want is that there should be full accountability and enforcement of any of these laws that we put in. We have to show the public that we are serious about getting done, and we are serious about investigating all matters, you know, rigorously, rather than simply looking to pacify a situation when we know for a fact it's not going to work that way. You know, no one is going to take fifty dollars when in fact they're mm -hmm. a thousand dollars. So we know we have to be realistic in how we approach that. So the incentives may not necessarily work, but the public campaign and sensitization of those communities is very important. C Commander, I don't I don't think you're responding to the incentives question. Your take? No on the incentive, um, you know, I, I I do agree that if you are going to get the hardened criminal, the man who took his, his money and bought a gun for criminal intent, he is going to want to at least get back a significant portion of his investment. And I don't think the payback program has been structured to encourage that. Um, but they, they, as I said, we have competing programs because they, they, there is a reward for the turning and, and the recovery of, of um, various types of weapons with different scales of payment. And um, it, to me, it should have been a part of the um, amnesty. Oh, okay. Um, let, let's now look at the, the modus operandi, when, you know, the whole thing in, pro, in, 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 in pros, progress and the process. Because days ago, the opposition leader reportedly raised concerns about, quote, the absence of accountability under the amnesty. Indeed, he wants a register to be established when a weapon is sur surrendered and a receipt generated for that weapon with its specifics, including serial number, make of the gun. What are your thoughts on that and your concerns? Mr. Diamond first. So I'm not so as much, uh, I'm not. I'm not aware of that information from the opposition. The the fact that you know amnesty yes. is not a, amnesty is not. I'm sorry, right. Amnesty is not a blanket immunity, and therefore some information would be necessary in order for us, you know, not to say that we're given a free hand to criminals that have committed acts with that weapon. So that's another reason why the public education information is so important. Mm -hmm because individuals need to know the ramifications of this. And for those law-abiding citizens, we also need for them to know that this is not a free pass to criminals, you know, and they may not support an amnesty when they consider that a weapon can be turned in and there'll be no accountability for what that weapon did in the past. So, mm. you know, it's a, it's a balancing act, yes, but the idea is that how do you get individuals to cooperate when you're hanging prosecution over their head possibly? So it's really something that should have been considered deeper. Uh, so you agree? You agree with that, that that quote from the opposition opposition leader? That's Regarding the registration, again, without seeing it in detail, I wouldn't want to agree with that because, again, you know, there are things there that have legal ramifications, and it's also there things that would be discouraging the individuals to participate. So we need to find that balance. The fact that weapons are going to be turned in, it's not just going to say one gun. I'm sure that the JCF would be registering the type of gun that makes it, et cetera. But we also have to keep in mind that many illegal weapons, illegally, have their serial number, identification numbers, you know, disfigured, defaced. So, mm -hmm. you know, there's, there's that challenge as well. Yeah. Uh, Commander Overton, what are your thoughts on, okay. on that? 
I, whilst I, I don't have the details of what has been in place and put in place for it, but I would assume, based on, on standard procedures, that this information is being captured and the registry is being created as to what guns have been turned in and whatever information that can be gleaned from, from it. Certainly, it would have to go to ballistics to capture the ballistic signature of the weapon that has been turned in and to match it against ballistic signatures that may have been captured from crime scenes so that we know that this gun has been in the, the, the active criminal network with a number of homicides assigned to it or shootings assigned to it so that we know what is coming in and what is there. So I, I can only make the assumption that this is in place and part of the process that's um, being executed. I'm seeing a, a, a question from a listener. Uh, what happens to the guns when they are collected? Are they destroyed or kept in case of evidence? What, what I mean, what, what, what I guess the listener is asking, what if it's a hot gun, you know, um, implicated in a, in a murder, for example? Um, do you know what happens in that case, Commander? To me, they, they, you, you can't have a conflict with an amnesty. If you've given an amnesty and guns have come in, they have come in. Um, your ability to tie it back to a person, um, I believe you have given immunity under the program. Hmm. And therefore, it's something that you have to be careful of. As a routine, yeah. yes, weapons that are recovered are eventually destroyed under the supervision of the FLA and the police. Uh, Mr. Diamond, any concerns there? Well, you know, um, again, the, the fact is that we need the public to, to be educated on what actually happens to an amnesty. The security minister mentioned that, you know, these weapons will go through a forensic examination, and if in fact it turns out that these weapons were used in a crime, then that individual that surrendered that weapon, if they surrendered it uh, personally, there will be questions in regards to where they got the weapon, you know. So there is that that catch twenty two as far as individuals participating. That yes. some information will be collected and they can be visited later. So again, you know, just for clarity, you're not amnesty, and amnesty is not necessarily an immunity. It just simply means that there is a process by which you can legally surrender your weapon. Now, it doesn't mean that if you committed crimes with a weapon, that you'll be, you know, a you know, absorb of that. No, absolutely not. You will be prosecuted. So that is something that I mean, we need to continue education on because that's the reason why they made a path where you may surrender your weapon to an attorney and then the attorney can turn the weapon. And of course, they're not under any obligation to reveal who they got the weapon from. So we do have a system here that requires more education for individuals to know how to participate. If they're speaking to Yeah, and it's interesting you mention about the um, the attorneys helping out the process because I also gather, gentlemen, that some JPs across the nation are concerned about the report of the Justice Minister encouraging JPs to assist people seeking to surrender their weapons. Mr. Diamond, do you have such concerns? Well, the, JPs, the JPs definitely, all JPs should be involved in that process because the JPs also are part of the process of applications for gun rights. So as long as you're part of the process, you should be also a part of the solution. There are many individuals we should incorporate in a gun surrender program. It doesn't necessarily need to be an amnesty, but we need individuals to surrender their weapons. And the only way we're going to do that is to show significant cooperation amongst all stakeholders, including the JPs, including the community pastors. You know, so this is a situation where we have individuals who in the past have helped to facilitate individuals. Now we have an amnesty. They must also help to facilitate, you know, good success in this or in communicating this to the individual. So yes, JP are, should, and should be a part of that process. But they're concerned about the, 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 um, the, the process, the protocols, you know. Uh, C Commander, Commander, you're taking uh, that. And I, I speak as a justice of the peace myself. Yes. But I certainly wouldn't be taking a gun from anybody to take it to the police, but certainly I would be a facilitator of getting it to the relevant authority for turn in. 
um, whether it by it be by having it placed at a particular place, and I I watch over whilst the the police or the authorities come for it, or I accompany somebody to turn it in where I can I can testify to to the the validity of the information that the person gives about the the turning of the weapon. But I wouldn't be driving around collecting guns from anybody to carry anywhere. Gentlemen, we're out of time. No. We're out of time. Thank you so very much for an interesting informative discussion. Stay safe. Uh, thank you, brother. Yes, you have a great day. Great. Listeners, the morning watch will return in just a moment. to Jane Bank today to find out about achieving your own sweet home in 30 days. The time by Jane Bank Mortgage is... The time is now 7.30 a.m. From generation to generation, Jamaicans have depended on Jane Bank to make the pride and joy of providing a safe place for their families possible. Now, with no processing fees and no down payment mortgage options, you can open the door to your own sweet home a legacy to hand to your next generation. Visit jnbank.com to get pre-approved today. JN Bank will help you find a way. I'm Tammy. I'm Wynn. And, and we, we are, are the, the Mitchells. Mitchells. Our life is a busy vibe. So Flow Yard and Road is made for our, our vibe. vibe. Power your everywhere vibe with Yard and Road and get up to 150 megabits per second fiber fast internet at home and fully loaded mobile with unlimited social and YouTube data. Anywhere talking text plus gigs and gigs of any use data. All for a special offer of $4,999 plus GCT. Yard and Road is for the way you live. Flow, Jamaica's network. Visit discoverflow.co. Conditions apply. Welcome back to the Morning Watch. Thanks for staying with us. I'm your host, Dylan Toussaint. Let's now look at the newspapers to see what Jamaicans and others are saying and doing in the Gleena. Issa Stalwart, George Forbes, has died. Condolences to his family and relatives. Also, 90 million HAJ breach. Chairman cites massive project variation. And in that note, sacked MD says, I'll never wear short pants in defense of integrity. In the Observer, Generation Z secures its first US House seat with 25 year old winning. And then, millions without a trace, Auditor General chides Health Ministry for bad record keeping in COVID-19 response. And finally, in Loop News, Clark, that's the Finance Minister, announces 60 billion increase, 60 billion increase in national budget. And we see also that JPS planned power outages for November 9 and November 10. I wonder where. Those are some of the major stories in our newspapers. Coming up next, we'll read some of the feedback from our social media question. How effective or successful will the gun amnesty be? We're asking you to leave a comment on our Facebook page and YouTube channel, Love 101 FM Jamaica, or WhatsApp, 876-997-3125. Soon come back. Another world of worship Wednesday is coming your way inside alive, but one to five, November 9, packed with worship, fun, and information. 
Stick around the program at 2 o'clock. More prayer, more power. Till the theme, we feature Naomi Rain as our worship our team of the day. Then at 3 p.m. is that a live Bible challenge. ABC Season 3, we bring you the fourth match in Round 1, featuring Chantel McGregor going up against Shanice Senior. All this and more will come your way is that a live 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. This World of Worship Wednesday, November 9, with yours truly, Sarah and the Chirpy One on the family station, Love 101. Give him praise, give him praise. Mandem. It's National Drug Awareness Month, and this week inside the mailbox, we take a look at the substance abusing man. What are the addiction differences in a man versus a woman? How can smoking, drinking, or snorting affect a man's relationship and intimacy? What ways can a man be prevented from drug abuse? We get to find the answers to these and more this Wednesday, November 9 at 5.30 p.m. inside the program designed for men, hosted by men with guests who are men. The mailbox is sponsored by Fossage Company Limited, your electricity electrical, solar, and lighting people. The mailbox happens every Wednesday at 5.30 p.m. right here on Love 101, the family station. Welcome back to the Morning Watch. Thanks for staying with us. I'm your host, Dylan Toussaint. Let's now join Victor. For a look at how our Facebook, YouTube, and WhatsApp friends answered today's question, how effective or successful will the gun amnesty be? Victor. Hi, Dr. Toussaint. So we have two responses on WhatsApp. Um, the first response is from Carrie Ann Case, and her response is, it's a way of getting in the guns, but do these elements really want to give them up? Um, do they want to give up something that gives them so much power? Without the guns, they are nothing. So giving them up is like giving up their livelihood. That's our first response from WhatsApp. Mm. The second response from WhatsApp is from Diana. Uh, Diana says, uh, good morning, morning watch. I don't think it will be... I don't think any hardened criminals um, are going to put down their guns, um, knowing that they have arrivals out there. The police have to go for them. Okay. All right. That's it? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you, Victor. I want to thank those who responded. We have taken into account what you have said. Very interesting comments there. Well, listeners, we now segue into the second watch. And the Statistical Institute of Jamaica recently reported continued improvements in the job market with the unemployment rate down to 6.6%. And that is based on a survey of the labor force. Could this uptick have any connection to the opening up as COVID slowly goes away? Well, to discuss these and other related issues, we have joining us Dr. Lekim Semaj, founder, chief ideator, above or beyond, and he's a psychologist. And we also have Dr. Sorry, Mr. David Wan, president of Jamaica Employers Federation. Good morning to you both. Good morning. Good morning, Dylan. Morning, Dr. Semaj. Good morning. Good morning Morning. Uh, uh, Mr. Wan, I just gave you a doctorate. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's charge for anything I know. <laughs> you, des you deserve it, man. <laughs> okay. Um. Yes. So, gentlemen, from your individual perspectives and experiences, how has COVID affected or impacted the employment in Jamaica? Beginning with you, Mr. Wan. Well, generally speaking, I think we all know that during COVID, the economy um, turned down and the employment went down and economic activity went down uh, in many spheres, particularly um, those that were involved in person-to-person -person contact, such as the hospitality industry and the fast food industry, et cetera. Mm. So it, it, it reduced it and now it's coming back. And, you know, which is to be expected. I just want to make one comment. Compared to last year at the same time, mm -hmm. the un unemployment rate moved 
down from 8.5 to 6.6. And that's good because we're comparing it to last year's rate during COVID because we were still in this, in the heights of the lockdowns a year ago. But I, I want to share with you, it's probably a little more context is useful in that we are comparing this year's July figure to last year July, whereas if you look at the most recent report prior to July, April 2022, the unemployment rate actually went up. It was 6.0 in April of 2022 and now 6.6. So that is a useful context to add a year ago versus the previous part. So I'd like you to, you know, Listeners yeah. Will appreciate yeah, interesting. Uh, Dr. Simaj, yes, your sir. response. Something I'm a little concerned about, you know, statistics. Yes, we know that they're useful, but what they actually measure. But there's another, there's a psychological background that I'd like to, you know, present as part of this. There are still persons who are not looking for work. Mm -hmm. and cannot mm -hmm. look for work. So statistics measure people, what percent of people who are looking for jobs and can't find. I don't think those figures in any way touch the real issue of the Jamaican economy. All right, when you go to the supermarket and you look at the price from one almost week to another in terms of who can afford what, when you look at the price of entertainment, just look at any, any, any entertainment thing being advertised, whether it's a, whatever the category, the thousands of dollars that is um, the, the, the entry fee and so on. When you look at what our quote unquote minimum wage is, by the way, I'm a firm believer that we need to start moving towards a livable wage. That whole construct mm -hmm. is something that societies have to find a way because look, you put money in the economy from that standpoint, it comes back into the economy because people can't eat the money. They have to use it to buy goods and services. When you look at the, what our schools are producing, the percentage of our people who are leaving school with no skills, no ability to function in a modern economy. When you look at all of those who during COVID figured out how to earn money from outside of the economy because there are many well, a significant number of Jamaicans have figured out how to stay in Jamaica and earn money online, legally or illegally. That segment of the economy is, is, is almost un, unmeasured, but there are more individuals who have figured out how to do that. That I think we're, when we pride ourselves and say, well, unemployment is down, it's, but there are so many other things that are happening which are not very exciting prospects in terms of how the, the economic life or the quality of life in Jamaica is being impacted. I, I'm, I, I'm still wondering, um, Dr. Simard, you mentioned about um, there are those who are not looking for work and yes. those who cannot look for work. It's that second category, I'm not fully understanding. Those who cannot look for work. Are you talking about adults? They cannot look for work? Well, the person who literally they know they 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 have no marketable skills in the, this modern economy, or they know even at different ages that what they would be paid, they tell me they can't work for that because they would make more money out of street hustling than what they would be paid if they should actually go and try to find formal employment. They know well, what it is. Well, 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 we define hustling because isn't hustling employment in, in, in some people's scheme of things? No, but that's not that's not the kind of measure we live. <laughs> hustling, I define hustling as <laughs> taking advantage of short-term economic possibilities. For example, rain is falling and you sell umbrella. Game mm -hmm. playing at stadium and you sell t-shirt. Huh? Mm -hmm. You figure out how to get a product or a service. I've seen some in, incredible hustling. I remember some years ago, I went to Rebel Salute. At the end of Rebel Salute, you know, it was rainy and muddy and all. The amount of people who had 
I mean, dozens of garbage, you know, scandal bag. And they would sell you a pair of scandal bag to put over your shoes. So you can walk from the car, you know, you can walk from the venue mm. to your car park and your shoes. Yeah, but hustling. <laughs> so, so hustling is just, you <laughs> see an <laughs> opportunity, you see a what way. What are they, Doc? Sorry, dear Doc. I'm going to hustle a little bit because we, we are for a time break. All right? So, we'll be back. <laughs> Ulcer Shield. Ulcer Shield is an all natural herbal product that will fight internal ulcers, acid reflux, leaky gut, irritable bowel syndrome, and bacterial overload. Put one teaspoon of Ulcer Shield daily in your favorite juice or tea and watch the improvement in the health of your gut. Get your Ulcer Shield today at Havco Herbs and Extracts. Call them at 876 540 8871. That's 876-540-8871. You work hard to make Jamaica a first-class destination. Isn't it time you receive the five-star benefits? Retire smarter with the Tourism Workers' Pension Scheme, a portable plan that also provides your family with financial security in case of your untimely death. It's easy, affordable, and accessible online. Retire and relax with the Tourism Workers' Pension Scheme. Visit twps.myguardiangroup.com or call 876-927-4105. Guardian Life. Live secure. Live easy. Welcome back to the Morning Watch. Thanks for staying with us. I'm your host, Dylan Toussaint. And in this, the first, or sorry, the second watch, we are looking at the whole matter of employment, employment. post-COVID. And in so doing, we have online Mr. David Wan, President of Jamaica Employers Federation, and Dr. Lekim Samaj, Founder, Chief Ideator, Above or Beyond, and a Transformational Psychologist. I'm going to allow um, Dr. Samaj to finish his train of thought. Right. I was saying that the, the, hustlers, the hustling component of the economy is still alive and living and, and doing, many hustlers are doing much better than employed persons at the lower end of the economy. And uh -huh. many of them could not be transformed. And then there's a part of the hustling economy, which is also the illegal economy, scammers, the kind of money that scammers are, are now making, the amount of money that the hustlers are making and have no desire or no impetus to be part of the formal economy. So the Jamaican yeah. informal economy is still alive and well, and much of it, it fuels the larger economy because those people have to spend money too. So they have to buy furniture and they have to buy food and they have to buy clothes. So we really... When we just talk about the formal economy, well, unemployment is down and so on, so that's a, that's that's not telling the full story. Uh, my big concern is that again, the large numbers of people who are not able to enter the formal system to get the full benefits of being part of a formal economy. I hear you. I hear you. I understand, Mister One. Um, may have to leave before the end of the program. So, Mister One, still here. Yeah, as far as you are aware, though, who and where are the persons being employed? Any any idea of the demographics? Are you asking what is causing this um, year to year uptick uh, in employment? Yeah, you yeah, put it that way. Okay, well, there's the usual suspects which have been, you know, examined in the recent past, and they are the construction industry. Employment has grown. The real estate and related services employment has grown and the call center bpos uh, employment has grown significantly over the last year so i would say those are the three main drivers of this year over year increase in um employment mm -hmm. and 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 are there any demographics in terms of um male versus female women versus men um from what i read on the statin report women enjoyed a higher increase in the in their employment than the men did and in looking at some of the data from statin the age group from um i think it was 19 sorry 20 to 34 
enjoyed a big increase. And I think a lot of this is due to their attraction to the DTO industry as an entry level mm -hmm. job in their career. Yes. So, so and I must ask, yes, and I must ask you before you go, uh, Mr. One, it's my understanding that the fast food industry has taken a significant hit um in terms of employment uh, is em its employees um why is that so and where have they gone right. do you have any idea um well let, let's take it one by one just like the tourism industry where you couldn't have that person-to-person -person contact uh, a lot of the consumers of the fast food industry decided to go contactless as well as drive through and most of the the dining tables in the fast food joints were closed for a long time. Mm. So you needed less staff serving at those tables. So they, you know, those persons have either migrated, found jobs in different industries that are not so hard hit by COVID, or they left the workforce and became entrepreneurs. Or, you know, as mm. Dr. Samar says, became entrepreneurs. And I want to make a <laughs> point of reinforce what Dr. Yeah. Samar is saying. Yeah. Uh, I'm aware of a group of persons who became high tech entrepreneurs, mm. uh, meaning that they are YouTubers. They're making money off doing YouTube videos. Mm. Tend to be younger people, tech savvy, who want to be entrepreneurs. And I'm pretty sure they are not counted in this. Group. Exactly. Yeah, that are when we're saying 6% unemployment, etc. And there's some of them are making good money off it. I saw one recently with a million views over a two, three month period. So, so, well, so they get paid, tech. Mr. One, they, they get, get paid, paid for, for the viewership? Every, every oh, time yes. somebody views, they get paid? What's that? As What's well, that advertisements that come on during their YouTube, if they uh -huh. have enough viewership, they'll get paid by YouTube also. Uh -huh. So, yeah, man, that's a, that's a growing industry. Mm. As well as Upwork, Upwork or WeWork, where you offer your services to people in say, Singapore to do things for them online. So we, we, have, we have some high-tech entrepreneurs in Jamaica. Interesting. Are, we call them hustlers. You know, I think that may be what Dr. Samaj was referring to. Be your own boss. Yeah, man. Do your thing. Yes, we are all kind of designations now. Um, Dr. Samaj, let's see if we can sort a look in the future now. Um, what are your predictions for Jamaica's job market as we near the post-COVID post era? The, I really believe that we need to... We, we have not yet unleashed the capacity of the Jamaican people, the Jamaican workforce. A lot of our young people are still being socialized. So go to school, study hard, pass your exam, and beg somebody to work. Now, mm. what happened in Jamaica over the last, say, say the post-independence Jamaica? Rex Netherford summed it up beautifully. It was the bottom third of the class that left school and created jobs and hired the top third to run the companies. Think about it. <laughs> Many of the people who are the leaders light in industry were not no bright spark. Uh -huh. But they had parents who had some money or they had some entrepreneurial zeal and they created business. And they invited, the, 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 the A's and the B students were the ones now that they hired to be the managers and so on. Uh -huh. As we shift to a knowledge-based economy, it is the A and the B students that have to now create jobs, the knowledge-based kind of jobs. Now, we not, we're not yet empowering, we're not yet exciting the A and the B students that they should convert those kind of capabilities into owning the means of production. So by doing so, the goal of unlocking that potential that is still there, the Dr. Watt. <laughs> You're giving my doctorate as well. Yeah, guess what? I'm the second one this morning. But guess what? No, I, I, I know his brother very well, and his brother is Dr. Wan. So. Okay. okay. Yes. <laughs> so maybe that's why. Look, the industries, for example, we, we need to. A lot of Jamaicans 
college graduates are now getting work in the BPO sector. And they don't enjoy that. Most of the ones that I've talked to, that's just a way to want eat a food until they find a real job. Mm. What there's a whole nother aspect of the, the, the work that we need to try and help people. There's this thing called geo arbitrage. Hmm? And it's, it's geo arbitraging that brings BPO to Jamaica in that if you outsource a labor activity to an economy that pays less than the near shore events in the United States, you can make a lot more profit. So you mm. hire people in Jamaica to do that job for you. The same kind of things that my company, we get a lot of our digital work done in places that I can't even pronounce the name. Because for $5 US, they can produce a video for you. For $20 US, what they can do that would cost $50,000 in Jamaica. So that kind of geo arbitraging. Now, yes. individuals are all not figuring out how to geo arbitrage that you can stay in Jamaica and you can sell your services in a hard currency area and make a lot of money, which when you convert it back at the 150 something to one now, you make a lot of money in Jamaica. We need to start to excite our young people about that aspect. Too many of our young people are just still being seen as the hewers of wood and the bringers of water in the equivalent. I remember a woman. Mm. Asking me, but Doc, I know you hire people for different companies and so on, you know, but, but, but I, 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 I tried to get a job. When she sent, she sent me a copy of her resume. She, for the last 12 years, she had worked in three, four different fast food places in different capacity. Now, in the United States, who work in fast food places? High school students, college students. Wow. Many, many Jamaicans have turned entry-level jobs in the fast food mm. place, in the careers. Mm. It's the same money you're going to be earning 10 years from now, 20 years from now. So that kind of revolutionizing the world of work that I've been talking about for the last 25 years. We have to start exciting young people about that. And guess what? They are the ones that are going to have to create this work because those who control the means of production are not anxious to do so. So even as mm -hmm. Mr. Wan mentioned, the whole YouTubers, the influencers, they created that for themselves. And they realized that once you have 10,000 views, you start qualifying for money. And then we get to 50,000 views. We have about two people or entities now that have, have topped the 1 million mark. Miss Kitty is over 1 million. And um, the uh, Rich, what's the name? I'm, I'm blocking on his name now. Uh, he's, he, he has That's topped okay. the 1 million. Huh? Right. I think you get the point you're making. Let me just bring in um the, Mr. Wan. <laughs> Mr. Wan, before you go, future. Yes. How does it look? I'm concerned a bit about the future of the world of work because I don't think we are making strategic moves in preparing our workforce for the future. For example, new technologies are coming quickly. Electric vehicles, um, Solar, solar equipment, um, mm. things like those. And I think we, we should pay more attention to equipping our workforce. Because, for example, once EVs become commonplace, which I think they will in a few years, um, we don't really have the cadre of people to fix these cars. Because all of those people that know how to pull a spark plug can't work on an electric vehicle. So we need to mm. start creating that kind of uh, capacity here to deal with um, future technologies coming at us rapidly. You know, the whole clean energy, there's a whole different set of skills that you need to deal with equipment for solar, solar, um, electric. Yeah. So that's yeah. one of my points. Well, yeah, we have to leave it there, gentlemen. Um, interesting, informative discussion and inspiring as well. Um, continue the good work, gentlemen. Have a safe day. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye now. Bless you. Thank you, listeners, for being with us. Join us again tomorrow as we continue to set the stage for a discussion of topical and controversial issues. For information or get copies of this program, call our production department at 876-968-959627.
This has been the Morning Watch. Thanks to our producer, Kathy Gale, and our guests. I'm Dylan Toussaint, giving a shout out to the pastors and members of the Miracle Open Bible Church as I hand you back to Love in the Morning with Victor Brown.